Okay, so let's just maybe for the people just to know why the two of us today are talking about these things. So maybe you should start with the introduction. Your yes, background. so um, as, uh, as my esteemed uh, colleague, uh, colleague highlighted, I've spent my career in finance and then I've moved, uh, uh, I went down the rabbit hole, the Alice, uh, Alice in blockchain, Alice in Wonderland rabbit hole of crypto in, uh, in 2018. And my focus has always very much been on uh, regulation and compliance <coughs> for the simple reason that um, for us it was very obvious that it was a space that it was going to be heavily regulated, same, same as, uh, as finance. Okay, uh, my name is Anna. I'm uh, like a fine artist for more than 20 years, but I also have a background of finance actually, finance and international law, because my uh, professional career actually started in a bank. So <coughs> combining these two things uh, ended uh, reasonably and meaningful in NFTs. But during all this time and researching monetary phenomena, I actually discovered crypto more than 11 years ago and was impressed like how, uh, how a different approach to uh, monetary, pheno monetary um, phenomena and as well uh, a different approach to finance is actually available and uh, humanity actually start to notice at uh, this very late stage. So uh, we have some solutions like, like uh, global, uh, like global community, uh, there are some solutions to uh, improve the system that uh, through many crises and to many situations has actually uh, show, uh, has, has shown so far so many times how exposed to failures it is. But uh, right now we actually are exploring this and making, uh, trying to, to find the meaning in all of this. So um, there's a long process in, in front, ahead of everybody who is uh, anyhow related to fintech, blockchain, crypto, and Web3. Uh, first of all, because it's, we are in the very early stage of all of this. So even if you have no like clue about some things or if, you, if some topics are quite hazy for you, uh, don't be discouraged or don't think that you are missing anything. So I guess from this, this audio that is quite heterogeneous, uh, will uh, get some information and insights of something that's not so familiar, not so close to what they're doing. But I hope the two of us, particularly right now, will some demystify some things and connect you with what you are following directly in, in the world of finance with something that you will see in the future. So maybe we can start by breaking down the blockchain space into blockchain as an infrastructure and then cryptocurrencies as an asset class. We'll, we'll get there in a moment. So what's, I think the main, the, the main novelty is actually the technology, right? DLTs are based on decentralized protocols. If you want, for the little story, decentralization is not new. It didn't start with Bitcoin. It started uh, many, many years ago. And for me, my belief is that Metallica had a big role to play in decentralization. Because for those of you that remember, in 2001, I think, there was um, a, um, a website called Napster, yeah? And Napster got shut down because it was centralized. You know, the servers were centralized. It was shut down because the drummer of Metallica decided to sue them. And parallel to this, once Napster was shut down, we started having the emergence of what we call the Gnutella protocol. And Gnutella was the first peer-to-peer -peer decentralized file sharing protocol in the world. And on top of Gnutella, some of you might be familiar with um, LimeWire was built on Gnutella, Bear, Bear something also was built on Gnutella. So decentralization started a long time ago. One of the challenges we had at the time was that there was no incentivization. Again, for those of you who remember, we used to leave our desktop open at night and people will come and download the files from our hard drive. So we were using electricity to allow people to come pick up these files. But we were not rewarded as uploaders. The genius, in my view, about Bitcoin is the input of incentivization. So for me, when I read the Bitcoin uh, white paper, it is based on something called the gossip protocol, which is the way nodes or computers communicate with one another and disseminate information which is exactly what we had in Gnutella. But then, the smart thing here was inventing this currency out of thin air and saying, now you're validating transaction and I'm going to give you this currency or I'm going to 
give you something to reward you, a reward. And um, yeah, in my view, this is that was the main revolution. This is what we lacked uh, in the in the in the early 2000s. Um, and in the end, it's true. Every work needs to be rewarded, and that was the amazing story about Metallica and Bitcoin. <laughs> So, back to basics. So now we have the infrastructure, blockchain infrastructure, which can be applied to various, uh, various industries. And today we're going to be talking about the financial industry broadly. Funny enough, as uh, my esteemed colleague Harriet right before me was saying, sometimes you have a solution that is looking for a problem. Yeah? So applying blockchain in general to the financial industry might not be really necessary. You have uh, spaces like equities that are very transparent, very quick, uh, very technologically advanced. That makes absolutely no sense to move equity trading and equity, uh, equity settlement into the blockchain. The only good thing that blockchain can do is real-time settlement for equities. However, you have other asset classes that are a little bit more antiquated, uh, like bonds and fixed income, uh, and private markets. And this is where we see the potential benefit of using blockchain technology to start creating a little bit more of liquidity in these, uh, in these illiquid, uh, illiquid markets. Now, if we want to look, so that's the technology, yeah? And now we talk about cryptocurrencies in general. So I thought it would be interesting to dive a little bit about what is a security, what is a commodity, what is a currency, yeah? So the definition of a commodity, it is a basic good that is used in the production of a new product. Yeah? You can think of oil that is used to uh, produce uh, gasoline, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, funny enough, in the US, the definition of a, the commodity for the CFTC is any asset that can have a future on it, or any asset where you already have a futures market. This is why in the US, Bitcoin and Ethereum are considered commodities. They're not considered uh, payment tokens or whatever you want to call it. So that's for commodities. Now, if you look at security, what is the simple definition of a security? It is a financial instrument that allow capital to move from those who have it to those who need it. Yeah? Now, when we think about this definition, what does it mean? Every ICO that occurred, in 2017, 2016, 2018, every ICO was actually a security because there was, the product was not live yet. These tokens were issued actually to raise funds. I know a lot of people don't like Gary Gensler of the SEC much, but on this point, he is uh, very much right. Now let's go back to currencies. What is a currency? A currency is three, three things, yeah? Um, a medium of exchange, a store of value, and a unit of account. Let's think together. What is a medium of exchange? It means it's something that you can go to any shop and exchange it for goods or services. Do we really believe that Bitcoin or Ethereum or any other cryptocurrency out there is actually a medium of exchange? Not really, in my opinion. What is a unit of account? Unit of account is the way you think. Today, you think you have... 50, when you think in terms, what is the value of your house? You're not going to say the value of my house is 50 BTC. You're going to say the value of my house is 1 million yeah, dollars or 1 million euros. So no, it's not, we're not even a unit of account. And then the last one is a store of value. That one is interesting because the concept of a store of value is basically when it is an asset that keeps its value in, uh, in my view, in a very volatile times or very volatile periods. Now, we all know that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are extremely volatile. So are they really a sort of value? Not in my view, but, but the very interesting thing is that they are actually a hedge, in my view again, it, they are a hedge against a black swan event, uh, a black swan event of loss of trust in the Fed or in the US Treasury. And proof is in the pudding. Every time there's you know, some uh, issues, of when we were talking about the debt ceiling a couple, uh, last week, we could see that Bitcoin actually was going up. The moment you start doubting 
that the Fed is going to blow or the US Treasury is going to blow, this is when Bitcoin actually performs. Because in the end, it is a financial, um, well, it is a payment infrastructure that is completely separate from any government. It's a decentralized payment, uh, payment infrastructure. Therefore, so now that we went through all the definitions, we can all agree that what we call cryptocurrencies are actually not currencies. They can be securities, they can be communities, uh, commodities. But in the end, in my view, they are an alternative asset class. So they are a new asset class that has its place in a diversified portfolio. So for those of you who manage your own, uh, your own portfolios, you have you put equity, you put bond, and then you put alternative assets. In alternative asset, you can put venture capital, you can put uh, real estate, you can put uh, commodities, and also will be very interesting now to also have an allocation to crypto. Yeah. And instead of just uh, constantly comparing, because uh, when you try to uh, explain something that you uh, either know that, that either of those things that you are uh, comparing, for example, people in the media usually did, especially in over the past 10 years or even earlier, uh, when these topics related to decentralization appeared like something quite new. And they're constantly comparing it to money is a crypto money, is crypto commodity, is crypto security. So as Amber said, the, the comp uh, comparison of these things is just isn't helping, especially if you're not deep into any of, the, any of these terms. But instead of this, just uh, everybody should be aware of the shift of the paradigm, especially when it comes to uh, financial approach and especially when it comes to the origin of the idea and the philosophy behind the crypto and the philosophy behind the blockchain, uh, like we had in a previous presentation by Harriet and saying like uh, blockchain is not, this, uh, blockchain, not every uh, solution, not every company, so not every subject needs blockchain in terms of everybody's talking and uh, expecting that in 10, 15 or maybe somewhere, 15, 20 years, somewhere in the future, everything will be on the blockchain, which is not true and we shouldn't anticipate things like that. Because uh, we should uh, think of the blockchain as, uh, just to understand it as the immutability at low cost, at lower cost than any other means of um, uh, using you, the database. I, 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 we need to be careful at lower cost. Uh, yeah, yeah in, terms, in terms of huge database, like in, uh, in, in, what, in these terms that actually require and need blockchain uh, for real, not for those things that don't need blockchain, not for those projects that uh, sound good and sound like a marketing uh, competitive advantage to be on the blockchain, just to be more no, like... It is costly, yeah. Yes. Having data on the blockchain. That's why I'm talking about. Uh, it's it's actually that is costly if you if your project is just uh, using this blockchain uh, blockchain idea to be better uh, more visible, better promoted promoted inside of the community and so on. But having just blockchain for blockchain is not the ultimate goal and not the purpose of blockchain. And you're actually not belonging to that. Uh, to uh, you're actually going to the uh, to to some universe that shouldn't be there. So this is actually why, uh, why people constantly compare things that are uncomparable and trying to push things toward, toward technologies that actually are too sophisticated and too complicated and even too expensive. So it, it actually doesn't correspond with the, with the original idea of blockchain that should solve problems, not to, uh, not to cause something and uh, to be presented like the uh, solution for the problem that doesn't exist. So we, we also have to preserve, uh, perceive this as kind of technology and some kind of new uh, financial paradigm in terms of new approach and uh, new ideas that are related to some new kind, new economic model, new financial model. Uh, and now we see what we have seen over the past uh, several years, especially during the last year with several scandals and stuff. Uh, we have actually seen that people are actually coping and uh, uh, coping and pasting from the, uh, what was actually the, the most negative attitudes and the most negative behavior and the most negative uh, psychological approaches to finance were seen in crypto industry. And that's why we have seen so many scams, frauds, uh, insecurities, and situations that were actually caused that has uh, de devaluated the, the whole crypto market that holds a tremendous um, crashes and uh, harms to, to the whole community and the whole uh, network. 
and seeing it now as uh, the perception of the of the broader audience, like uh, there there's there, it's some is the area that is full of scams. That it, that's the area with a lot of uh, bad things and so on. So don't trust crypto. Don't trust don't trust blockchain, which actually shouldn't be the case. Uh, in this situation, actually. What we criticize in all these crypto and um, similar scams is actually that we criticize the approach that is centuries long. Like it's not like something uh, centuries old. It's not like something that is uh, that is that become and that was uh, visible and that popped up with the crypto. So scams are as old as money. Scams are as old as trade. So it's nothing new. We just copied the wrong models and many many subjects did it and tried, tried to do something and failed, but also making harm to the, to the rest of the crypto and blockchain community. So that's actually the, when, when, the, when the broader audience, when the, and also regulators uh, start to uh, distinguish things and when they become honest with something, what's really the philosophy of crypto, what's really the approach that we are, that we are connecting with the technology, in these terms, it would be easier even for regulators, but even for those who have no uh, connections with the technology to start being afraid of using it and to start be afraid of uh, like being connected with that kind of technology. I so, agree. Yeah, I mentioned regulations. <laughs> I mentioned regulations, so that's that's the, the, another topic, and I think that uh, would be uh, everybody might ask if everything is decentralized. It was one of the most common questions. So, if everything is decentralized, if everything is not governed by uh, by any subject, if anything is like okay, there's no government behind blockchain, there's no government behind crypto, no government, no entity, nobody behind any of these, no decision makers. So. Why then do we need regulations if technology can solve everything? And uh, there are plenty of reasons, reasons to regulate some things, especially, for example, if you compare it with the traffic. Okay, when the first car is, was, is, was invented, everybody was like impressed. Okay, we have now a means of transportation. We have now something that is much, much uh, faster than like horses and anything else that we used in the past. So now we have many cars and many, many cars. Okay, it's time to put a traffic light. It's time to put some signalization. It's time to not to make the technology being destructive because people usually who are using it, it's not, not the technology that is bad. It's the way people use it that might turn it and create some bad behavior and make harm to others. So imagine uh, traffic, transportation without signalization, without traffic lights, without any uh, any element as such. So there will be a disaster. Even now when we have all of this, there's some situation where people re react because not following the rules. So it's the same in any industry and there's no difference uh, from, these, all these, uh, from all these rules uh, and crypto as well and blockchain to regulation has to be present is the only thing actually how those who create the regulations, those who bring the, make decisions, and those who adopt the laws, who are at the end political entities like parliaments, because any uh, any uh, like uh, document, any directive, any law uh, is first uh, for the the people who prepared are working closely in some working groups and entities are um, very uh, like. Uh, they were skilled and uh, are connected with the, in the industry in general. But later it goes to be a part of the political decision. It's something that actually uh, becomes uh, the, the decision of those who, uh, who have not, not so many connections with the industry in general. So that's the situation even in crypto. It's, we may say it's even too early to, to have any regulation that could be uh, complete, that could be uh, like, um, comprehensive. But so far, it's better to start from something. So uh, the way we, we perceive as regulation is not like something that should be very restrictful because having that uh, authoritarian approach, like ban everything, for, uh, block everything and so on, uh, doesn't create additional value that the whole industry is uh, actually seeing uh, through, through the, the possibilities that the technology per se opens. Uh, but so far, it's better to start from any kind of uh, regulation, any kind of uh, starting point, such as Mika, uh, to, to start using and to create some framework and then to upgrade it constantly, but really constantly, not like have another document in, let's say, two or three years, because it's too long, uh, it's too long period for an area that is really dynamic and that is really updating uh, on a monthly basis. 
So, agreed. The, the, the challenge with the regulations in general is that regulations are retroactive rather than proactive, yeah? Even in the finance industry. It's only when, excuse my French, shit hits the fan that we start solving the problems. Now, the, the thing that is very frustrating about uh, crypto is that a lot of us come from finance. A lot of us have gone through the 2008 crisis. And a lot of us have decided to replicate the same mistakes that we've done in 2008 in all of the CDFI, uh, CDFI entities. And that, to be honest, when I was looking at the balance sheet of FTX or when I was looking at Celsius or at, uh, BlockFi, it was indeed very frustrating because, you know, the, the, the errors that they have made are the same errors that the bankers have made before them. So, indeed, regulations are necessary, whether we like it or not, for the simple reason that, you know, people who go into business, and I'm, not talk, I'm talking from, if you look at any psychological report, they will tell you people who are CEOs are people who are a little bit narcissistic and very greedy, yeah? So you know that people that are going into new technologies are narcissistic and greedy, I'm sorry, that's the fact. And these people actually need rules to make sure they don't destroy everything around them. So that's one point. The second point is finance in itself is a very regulated industry. Finance in the US is three times more regulated than healthcare, yeah? So the blockchain and crypto arrive to disrupt a space that in itself is very regulated. So it's make, it makes it harder to actually move fast in this space, knowing that you know, we're in finance. Now, if you, if you to take a little bit of a, of, of a look back in time, when we started having data sharing and social medias and Facebook and all of this, there was no regulation in the space at all. GDPR, when was GDPR voted in? 2000? 2000. No, uh, sure. yeah, a couple guess, of years maybe ago. Maybe somebody has the A couple of years year. ago. Yeah. Eight. Eight. 2018. 18, sorry. Yeah. When was Facebook founded? 1998, um, something like that. Um, so, really. yeah? yeah? No? Okay. So, the, the social media space was allowed to actually move quickly without any reg regulations in space. It took like, what, 20 years for people to start thinking about regulation on data. Um, so yeah, for us, it is quite challenging, but it is very important to work with the regulators to make, again, sure that consumers are protected, that uh, the, 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 there is market integrity, because um, the market is absolutely not integral in crypto. There's a lot of... Um, uh, market manipulation, everyone knows, everyone has heard about this, whether it's on exchanges that are completely not transparent, which in you know any regulatory space in the world, you should be transparent and you're not. Funny enough, we're in blockchain. I always say, blockchain is about transparency. Blockchain businesses are the least transparent in the world. Exactly. Okay, uh, and they also there, there are some uh, points, for example, how techn uh, technology can uh, support regulation as such. Uh, particularly if you, for example, look from the NFT perspective. Uh, I can particularly say from the perspective of a fine artist and somebody who uh, has with a group of artists uh, struggling for almost two decades to show actually how there are means for uh, copyright protection of visual arts on the internet. Uh, so many, many institutions, we have started this like uh, in, in the beginning of the century, trying to explain actually how uh, there are means, because in some other industries, especially uh, in some other uh, also creative industries, but also in sports and so on, there are means of protection, uh, some original uh, sources of income, and wherever something is being redistributed to another entity, also the, the initial owner of something uh, has the uh, has, has the right for that source of income. Uh, for example, you can compare to the music industry in general, without blockchain, without NFTs, where you have a copyright for like streaming and so on that pays the, the copyright, uh, actually pays the copyright to the, uh, to the artist and to the, to the creator of the content. Also in sports, you have like in sport clubs, when you have like a transfer from the players to one another, also the, the, the original club actually is always, always earning some uh, amounts of money for, if, if the player uh, has initially uh, started his career from, from that 
particular club. Uh, but in fine arts, uh, you had a means of like regulating stuff like this, especially when the galleries and other entities and uh, companies that are trading the uh, digital arts are reselling things. So what we wanted to share uh, to to actually uh, to share like a means of regulation is to use the way the digital art is being transferred from one tr uh, one subject to another uh, with some uh, funds, with some actually earnings of, uh, that belong to the artist. Everybody was saying it was not possible because they were earning a lot and they wouldn't like to give up of the earnings, particularly because uh, on, on a yearly basis those are really big amounts for for galleries and for uh, owners of materials of digital art. How, how much uh, do galleries charge? 20%, yes? Uh, it depends on, the, depends on the gallery. Sometimes it's even, especially when it's sold on the bids and uh, on the auctions, so it's, it's a, it might be really even, even more. So it depends. And now uh, we have NFTs, like kind of technology that has shown that it is actually possible and that we already have the origin because uh, without having the ideas and the philosophy that's behind the, the NFTs, we couldn't have it as a, as a cre we couldn't create that kind of technology if the original idea didn't already exist in humanity, in, in culture. It was just the means of applying that approach to some technology. And now we actually see that the technology is a tool of regulation and the technology is actually democratizing the whole process and being more fair towards the authors and towards creators. Which means that actually now uh, we, have, we have a situation, sorry, uh, this is something with my microphone. Uh, so the, the situation is that uh, we now have the, the we now have the that tools for for uh, regulating, and we now have something that is uh, that is more. Uh... Okay, this is a question for Amber, uh, the first one. Sorry. In your opinion, who is going to win CBDC adoption and final crypto regulation race? <coughs> U.S. versus you. Okay. So CBDC, CBDC is a, a completely separate subject. One thing I want to say about this, CBDC in the US makes sense. CBDC in Europe or the UK makes zero sense, and I'll tell you why. The US infra, payment infrastructure is super antiquated. If you want to transfer from a local bank in one state to a local bank to another state, it will take you five days. United States, five days. In the US, we have an infrastructure that is called faster payment, Within a couple of seconds, money is transferred in, in real time. Similarly, I think in Europe, I can't remember the name of the infrastructure, but similarly in Europe for the Euro, SIPA. SIPA. Yes. So CBDC, Europe, UK, zero cents. Uh, the way it has been pushed, I think you know, central banks just want to be in the know and in the hype. Uh, <laughs> the only interesting thing that it could have been is actually for cross-border uh, for, for cross-border transfers. But CBDC in the UK, at least, is not going to be applied for cross-border uh, transfers. And now the challenge in cross-border transfers is that you have every country has a different infrastructure for its CBDC, yeah? So how are you going to reunite all of these different bank infrastructure? So it's a complete headache. In my view, it makes no sense. In the US, it makes sense because of the payment infrastructure. In terms of the regulation, we have Mika in Europe, Mika is quite good, and it's uh, one of the clearest, I would say, uh, regulations out there. Uh, in the US, it's a complete, uh, excuse my French, again, shit show, let's put it this way. Uh, and I, I say this because I have worked, so I've worked with an SRO in the, in the US, and our goal was to create a self-regulatory organization, which is similar to the FINRA that regulates brokers, uh, brokers, dealers in the US. We've been working with the US government, we've been speaking with the SEC, speaking with the CFTC, pushed in some bills, and then just like everything came uh, crawling, crashing, crashing down. So yeah, you asked, I'm not sure what they're doing. Some of the things that you're seeing uh, there, I mean, you know, I, I don't like the secret stories, people telling you, you know, they want to break down crypto, they want to destroy crypto. But some of the things we're seeing, like what happened with Signature Bank, you're like, okay, what are these guys doing, like, for real? So Europe is in a much better position than, uh, than the, uh, the US. Dubai is doing fantastically well. Singapore, Switzerland, you have very clear regulations there. How do I question? 
What do you think about China and crypto? Now in Hong Kong, bringing back retail crypto trading. Is China next? The problem with China, <clears throat> the problem with any country where you have control over the currency is capital outflows. So when you have India, you have China, it's very regulated there for the simple uh, challenge that you don't want the money to go get out of the country. I would say until you have no control over currencies, any country that has control for currencies will actually not push for crypto. Uh, would you say that investing in crypto is more a way of trying to secure some assets of yours rather than it being a smart investing method? Secure some assets of yours. What do you mean by that? So investing in crypto, as I was saying a little bit earlier on, for me, it's an alternative asset class. Fantastic for you to have an allocation, similar if you have your allocation in equity, your allocation in bonds, your allocation in commodities, just have a small allocation to crypto. Okay, no more questions? No more questions. Okay, good. We have still time to continue. Okay, one more. Ah. Maybe you have to refresh. Do you think switching to blockchain could potentially ruin a business or make their business harder, or is it just not necessary for some to transfer? Exactly what, what Harriet said. said, exactly what I said, exactly what she said. Sometimes it's a solution looking for a problem. When we started having the hype in 2018, every company and their mother of the company wanted to apply blockchain. You don't need blockchain in most cases. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a wa waste, the, waste of time, yeah. waste of energy, waste yeah, of assets. Yeah, I would just mention, and uh, it's actually the area of my research, blockchain and supply chain, but blockchain in maritime supply chain with that company Mueller, Maersk and IBM started in 2018. Uh, it was like a big, huge, huge project with trade lands. Uh, it, was, it was very, very promising because the, just uh, imagine the amount of uh, the goods that are shipped uh, worldwide and still in in this uh, in these uh, means of transportation, 90 percent, even more than 90 percent of the goods worldwide are still shipped uh, by, by vessels. So that's why we we have that huge amount in on in, uh, international trade every day, which the the amounts of money spent or on shipping are huge. And uh, that's also the, the some situations and scandals that appear, like Qingdao scandal in, 20, in, in the beginning of this decade in China, with, with the ports exporting more than they actually did, and so on, faking the data, and so on. Blockchain appear as a big, good solution because you have fake information about China, Chinese uh, exports uh, based on something that you didn't have a database to control. You double the data, and so on, and so on. It's this big scandal that uh, caused the damage to. Uh, some banks that gave the loans and so on. So blockchain appear as something that will perfectly solve this. And after five years of very, very tough research related to uh, trade lands, related to uh, co cooperation of IBM and the Danish maritime company Maersk, uh, now uh, in, the no in November last year, they decided that they like shut down that project. Actually, they put it on hold because uh, the application of blockchain to that type of uh, mm -hmm. supply chain is not something that the, that the, the market is already, that the infrastructure is fit, and it's not something that will uh, can apply uh, in, in such short terms, like five years of very deep research and experiments and pilots uh, wasn't enough to uh, persuade anybody that it could be a good solution and it could be cheaper solution uh, and that would be eliminate uh, all the expensive, the expensive and uh, even damages that were created uh, in the interna international uh, maritime transport, which actually means that uh, it will take years to uh, show which uh, industries are blockchain fit and, with, and uh, to which, in, uh, to which areas and to which uh, databases actually blockchain is really solving the problem, not creating another mm -hmm. layer of uh, like trying to solve the problem. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, supply chain uh, applications are quite interesting um, in the, uh, the agricultural space. I've seen some projects that are very, very nice um, where basically you're able to track the mango from where the mango comes all the way until it's, uh, it's sold in Europe. But the interesting part about it is that you know exactly how much has gone to the farmer, because like the cost of a mango, 90% goes to the intermediaries and 
uh, everyone in between the farmer and the 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 buyer. So it's yeah, I thought these were some nice applications. Yeah, it will be everything will be more feasible when the the transaction costs of the uh, blockchain as such would be actually when we, when we include the gas fees and the the, the smart contracts costs uh, would be like lower than uh, the the general benefit of all these. So these processes are now quite expensive. So imagine like any business moving to blockchain with all these expensive the gas fees and uh, the the cost of building smart contracts in these terms is like something that uh, so far. Even the, the industry that is pa as powerful as maritime industry, and with the with the like scale of it, like 90% of the total goods worldwide, uh, it's still not blockchain fit. Interesting, you were talking about uh, about fees. I really find it fascinating how an infrastructure that is supposed to democratize finance is actually more uh, more beneficiary for the super rich than the the smallholders. Yeah, because to the difference to the financial industry, where you have your fee is always a percentage of the transaction, in, in blockchain spaces, it's a fixed fee. So if you send 100 million, you're paying the same amount as if you're sent, when you send a hundred dollar. I find this fascinating. Exactly, exactly. And we usually criticize some uh, payment solutions that are have that like kind of fees that are uh, fixed for some amount of money up to this one. And then, then the next class is from this one to this one is this one. So uh, it's like you, you usually criticize this and see like, okay, this is very democratized the means of solution. It will be make uh, it, uh, accessible financial inclusion, which is a hot topic when you're all Always talking about unbanked and underbanked people who will mostly benefit from blockchain. Like everybody, everything will be free, and everybody can join, and everybody can earn from it, and everybody can sell it. But without mentioning these fees, these fees are actually like something that the blockchain community is pretty silent when it comes to this topic, and should be. Raise more awareness, especially when it comes to. Uh, if, uh, if you remember what was the mar NFT uh, market looked like in 2021, uh, when the gas fees were like huge, uh, very very high, and uh, people were like, okay, I have some collection, I want to post it, uh, I want to actually mint it, and uh, many many artists actually gave up when they saw how big gas fees and and uh, how how much how expensive it could be. So this is actually something that the, the, everybody who is trying to explain what's going on in, in a blockchain society, in crypto community, or in any industry that is related to this uh, should not skip this very uh, crucial topic and should not uh, think like that it doesn't exist just to attract more people and then make them, make them uh, being disappointed at the end when they find out what actually is behind it. So we have a question for both of yeah. us. If implemented by governments, could cryptocurrencies help them and businesses spy on us? So my answer is, we're already being spied on. I mean, you have your cell phone, it's tracking everything you do. Siri is listening to you talking to your friends and is able to give you ads that match what you're discussing. So on the subject of spying, I think there's already, already too much spying. Cryptocurrency is not gonna add or take anything out of it. Yeah. We have one more question, sorry to interrupt, because we just have time for one more question. Uh, for Amber, actually, uh, would you agree that ETH is a digitally native medium of exchange and unit of account, but it's just early in its adoption cycle? Um, the person asking this question says that they know many people who are using ETH price uh, virtual goods like NFTs, as well as actually um, denominate their net and worth portfolio in ETH. Well, it, okay, if you're saying early in its adoption, yeah, potentially, but I don't really see see it becoming a, um, a unit of account for real life assets, yeah? No one is gonna talk about buying their house at something ETH, right? So, it, so it's actually quite interesting because you can always think about these uh, protocols as their own mini countries, yeah? And this is when the concept of currency for a protocols becomes very interesting, um, especially if you want to compare them to emerging markets. The best comparison, in my view, when you're looking at risk, is comparing these protocol to emerging markets from a political risk. So political risk is what, uh, 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 govern governance risk is the equivalent to political risk. Uh, cyber, security, uh, cyber security risk is also equivalent to political risk. Economical risk is the tokenomic risk. 
Uh, what else do you have? Currency risk. Well, yeah, very volatile currency, high yielding volatile currency. So very similar to emerging market. And in this case, yeah, you can say actually it is the currency of a protocol in itself. But is it a real world currency? In my view, not much. And time is up. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Yes, time is up. Uh, this was definitely an insightful conversation. It was a pleasure listening to you speak. Guys, please give it up for Amber and Anna. Thank you.